I'd like to show you why knowing your why is the start of your journey. Without a strong why, it can be so difficult to reach your maximum potential. My name is Dr. Jason Ballara, and every week I meet with real estate investors and mindset specialists that are taking action in order to build a life according to their own terms. We will break down what drives successful people and allows them to achieve at such a high level. If you are a professional wanting to break through, or simply someone that wants to hear an inspiring story, the Know Your Why podcast is made for you. Hi everyone, I'm Jason Ballara and this is the Know Your Why podcast. Uh, today I'm here with Bronson Hill. Bronson uh, is quite a, an accomplished uh, real estate investor. He ha- He's a general partner in 1,400 multifamily units worth over $100 million. Um, I think he's got quite a bit of a story in terms of capital raising and so I'm very interested to hear about that. Um, thanks for coming on the show, Bronson. Awesome, Jason. I'm so excited to be here. And I, I just love the title of your podcast, Know Your Why, because I think that really drives, it should drive everything that you do. So I'm really excited to talk and, and get more into my why, your why, our whys, and why are, why we should have whys. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Why behind the, why have you behind having a why? <laughs> if you have um, a good why, it makes you wise. <laughs> right, right. Um, well, why don't we just start, maybe you can give us a bit about your background, how you got started in real estate and kind of uh, what got you, you know, to the point of, of such impressive numbers at this point? Right. So, um, so my background, I was in the medical field as a medical consultant, did some sales for about 10 years. And basically I tried to do, uh, you know, become financially free to be able to retire with passive income, but I try to do it through single family, which I think a lot of people that think, oh yeah, I've heard real estate's great. I should buy a house and another house. And we got to four houses and it was just a lot of work. And I basically, um, I had a cousin or I have a cousin that um, is, has been doing multifamily for years. And I, again, I was had this great corporate, well-paid job doing, you know, I really could do it in, you know, 20, 30 hours a week and make really good money. And yet I was really wanting to get more into real estate beyond just a single family. And so like I said, at that time, my, my blueprint really was to take uh, four houses and turn it into eventually 30 houses and have passive income. And just really, you know, retire with that. And I told this cousin of mine, I said, hey, this is what I'm looking to do. And he said, well, it's an interesting idea, but why don't you do multifamily? Everybody that I know that does multifamily wishes they'd started sooner. And I said to him, I said, well, that's great. I don't have the money. I don't think I can do multifamily. It just sounds like it takes a lot more money than single family. And he said, well, you can raise the money. And so he kind of said, you know, listen to this podcast, go to this training, uh, read this book. So I basically did everything he said. And over a period of time, I was able to, uh, you know, raise money for my first deal, then kind of find a partner, raise a bunch more money. So I've raised about $20 million now in the last three and a half, four years. And I was able to leave my great corporate job just to focus on helping busy professionals become financially free. And so, uh, yeah, so it's kind of, it's been an interesting road, but it's really exciting. It's a lot of fun. Um, You know, I'm learning constantly, but uh, I think you know, the why behind that is, is obviously more important than just financial freedom. There's some other things that for me really drive me beyond that. So it's, it's exciting. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. Yeah, no. And I think, uh, you know, a couple of things that, that you touched on there are sort of common themes that I've heard from people I've had as interviewed on the, on the podcast or, or heard on other people's podcasts and things like that, but that, you know, sort of that transition from single family to multifamily, uh, you know, a lot of it has to do with just what you said. It's like, well, I don't, I don't have the money to buy a large apartment complex. And you, you, most people don't know that virtually nobody has the money to buy (laughs) a large apartment complex all on their own, that that's just kind of not how it generally works. I mean, there are people that probably have the money, but that's still typically not the way that uh, you know, buying multifamily works. And so you start, you start where you think you can accomplish. And then you, I, I think the thing that hit me was I realized, okay, when I started to do the math about, and you said you had, you know, you had your goal of, of 30 houses, right? So I had s- started to do the math. I don't even remember exactly what the, the number I thought I needed of single family houses to get to, to have financial freedom. But it struck me that, okay, wait, how long would it, like, even if I made the number a hundred, how long will it take me to buy a hundred apartment comp or a hundred houses versus one apartment complex that has a hundred units? Like, even if it takes you a year to find that one complex, 
you've essentially <laughs> it, it just the ability to to scale and step up is is so much faster in, in multifamily. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. When I started learning about multifamily, Jason, it's it's it, it's something like you just you kind of touched on it that you know how can I buy right now? We're buying an eighteen million dollar project in Florida. It's one hundred and thirty plus units, and you know it's like I don't have eighteen million dollars, so we're financing uh, you know about seventy five percent of that. Even some of the construction costs, we're raising uh, a little over five million dollars for it. I think I'm I'm bringing maybe two million or million and a half, two million, whatever it is, to this deal. Um, but you know the amazing thing about uh, thinking about single family versus thinking multifamily. Multifamily is really a team sport. So it's something that it, it's like pieces to a puzzle that you, nobody can really do it all. It's very difficult to be able to do it all. But the benefit of it, if, if you set up your business in that way, that you're like, oh, I can bring money or, hey, I can find a deal or I have this asset management experience, you can find partners and you can basically help to do uh, amazing. I mean, you can just add so much more value. And so that's great for the active side, for the passive side, especially for busy professionals, um, just the ability to scale without taking up more of your time. And I know a lot of people, even for myself, once I got to four houses, I was, I was like, man, this is a lot of work. And even though I have property managers, it's out of state, uh, man, I thought of having 30, I'd just be every day, I'd be getting things that I need to make decisions on and something goes wrong and a tenant this and whatever. But when you have a hundred units in one place, you have typically you know, three or four full-time people that are dedicated to that property you're not really dealing with that stuff on a day-to-day -day basis and it becomes much more of an efficient financial asset. And so once people get the confidence uh, and I've talked to over 1200 individual, you know, high net worth investors. And once people kind of get it and they invest in a deal, they kind of realize like, wow, like this is actually doable. I actually can scale this and it doesn't take up much more of my time. I bet the deal, I bet the, the operator, and then I can just basically see uh, how that will function over time. So I, I, just, I just love it. I feel like it's, it's amazing between the tax benefits, the higher returns, and just there's so much about it. I know you're a huge fan of multifamily as well, but it's just really the best thing that I'd never heard of. And I'm so glad that my cousin was like, you should look into a large multifamily. And I was like, oh, okay, I'll look into that. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's nice to have that sort of built-in family mentor that can kind of steer yeah. you in that direction. That That's uh, probably something a lot of people don't have. But, um, and you, you mentioned sort of what I think, this is really a good topic to sort of dive into for, especially for people that are trying to actively uh, actively invest. And then we can sort of look at it from the other side too. But you, you talked about, you know, you've spoken to over 1200 uh, high net worth investors. So maybe walk us through a little bit about your approach to that. Even when you were first starting, you're like, okay, I, I'm going to have to, because I feel like myself included, a lot of people, that's, that's daunting right? Like we're, we're kind of, I think once you're in the, this industry, you know, you're tossing around numbers like, oh, we have to raise $5 million that it's an $18 million thing. Like some people hear those numbers and automatically, I think their mind shuts off, right? They're right. Just like, I, yeah. there's no chance I can be involved in something of that level. And so when you're kind of approaching that with the investors, what, what do you, what tactics, I guess, do you use to, to really, and it's not, I mean, I guess it's maybe you tell me what you think it's sort of sales, but in a way, you're not, you're not asking for money, right? You're, you're providing opportunities. So how do you, how do you approach that? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a great thing. I, I love talking about it. Cause yeah, it's really hard to just go up to somebody, even that, you know, and be like, Hey, would you give me money for this, whatever thing it is? So uh, I like talking to people that are just starting out uh, as far as, Hey, I'd like to raise money. I'm not quite sure how to do it. And for me, I had this concern. I was like, okay, I'm going to raise money for deals. I went to, I had, you know, a deal I was looking at. And I thought I've had, you know, over 60 conversations. I think it was 63 conversations with friends or family, people that I knew someone would invest. And then um, I, I got introduced to, at the first meet, I actually started a meetup um, kind of shortly after that conversation with my cousin, yeah, maybe three or four months later. And we had a bunch of people show up because I partnered with you know, a lot of his partnership. I partnered with somebody who had an established meetup and I met a guy for the first time at this meeting who said, uh, just kind of out of the blue, was like, oh, I'd invest in one of your deals, whatever. And I didn't even, I was like, oh, wow. So I got his card and we got, we got coffee. And basically I showed him what a sample deal would look like. I'd say, well, I don't have a deal, but if I did, this is what it would look like. And, I, and he said, oh, I'd, I'd invest a hundred thousand in a deal like that. And so basically from that same first meeting, I also um, 
found a guy who uh, had a deal, was, was raising money, and I looked at the deal, the deal looked good. So I basically introduced the two of those guys, and that's how I raised the first $100,000. Now, the other side of the story, as I mentioned, 60, 63 people that I know well, you know, they did not, they chose not to invest. Now, some of them have now, it's been years later, whatnot. But uh, a lot of times the challenge is, you know, I know your background is as a veterinarian. I know there's, you know, other people listening have different backgrounds. It's hard when people know you for a certain thing and they don't know you as a real estate Jason or real estate Bronson. They know you as medical person or vet, per, you know, they know you as someone else. And so the first, I think most important thing people can do or listeners can do if they want to raise money is start a MailChimp or active campaign email account and basically add all your friends and family and just start saying, Hey, I'm going to this conference. This is, or, you know, just weekly or monthly stuff of here. Here's what I like about multifamily. Just start putting things out there. And you mentioned kind of just a minute ago about adding value. And so when you start adding value over time and people see, you know, what you're talking about, then those conversations begin to happen. And so I think it's, it's a lot of it just kind of starts with how you position it and learning and then kind of sharing the journey that you're on, because those people that know you really well, they, they trust you but they don't necessarily trust you with their money or trust you with their investments. So they've got to get, that's like the second hurdle. They got to trust you, but they also got to trust that you're competent. Yeah. So, so I think, you know, getting started, I think it's just, you know, starting to tell the story, going to meetups, going to events. Uh, the conversation is a little, usually a little bit later, but uh, I think it's just, again, positioning yourself as somebody is, Hey, this is, this is what I'm doing. This is why I love this. And when people sense that excitement, they're drawn to it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, your point about people know you as something already, right? Unless you were, you know, you come out of college and you become a real estate investor, unless you're sort of right there, that's your whole career, people know you as something else. And so I sometimes feel like it's almost harder to, like, people trust me to do surgery on their dogs, like that, without a yeah. doubt, like, people trust me to do that. But when I start to have these conversations about like, hey, we've got this great deal, uh, this will really help you. You know, you won't have to work so much. All of the stuff that I think is just amazing when it comes to real estate investing, it, it, it's almost met with a lot of skepticism. So I, I, I totally get, you know, you gotta, it, it, it's, it can potentially be easier to have those conversations that pe with people that don't know you as something else already. They, they're meeting you as the real estate investor. Exactly, yeah, it, 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 it is, yeah, again, you're, you're kind of changing the story because it's like when you go to your mechanic or you go to someone who does, they're a doctor, like, you, you know, you know them in that role. You don't know them if they start talking about, oh, I also do, you know, I sell vacations to wherever. And you're like, well, that doesn't really fit because you're a doctor or you're a mechanic. That doesn't... Right. So it's just, again, telling that story. That's why that uh, I, I recommend the active campaign program because it's you can scale it up very easily. And that's, you know, what a lot of people use is what I use now. And it just it helps you to build, but the idea of just really adding value. So again, I try to think about, uh, you know, a lot of people, they don't really know much about finance or, you know, they have a money person, especially a lot of high paid professionals. They pay somebody a couple percent per year and they just manage their stuff and they don't worry about it and they go to work. And that's, and for a lot of people, that's fine. But I, I think the more you understand really how that works and what people are doing is that they would be so much better off being in multifamily syndication because the returns are like two to three times higher. There's tax benefits. There's all kinds of lower fees, all this stuff. But like, we don't know what we don't know. And that's why when you start educating people about it, here's what I like about it, here's what's happening or whatever. And it's, it's more just about, hey, I just want to tell you about this really exciting thing. And now like, hey, I want you to invest in my deal. People then will be like, oh, well, how do I do that? You know, whatever. So it's almost like people have to kind of get there themselves. Yeah. So I try to never really ask anybody unless they've you know, they've reached out saying, Hey, I want to join your investment club or I want to, and we make it easy. We don't make it hard. We kind of put things up to help people do that. But um, I think just again, continuing to lead people in that and just educating them and helping them. I think people we're drawn to people like that, right? We, we become a guide and a coach and then people see that, Hey, this person's really interested. Like, you know, I, I really don't care if people invest in my deals, like that's great, but you know, I just, I want them to invest with great operators and I want them to get into deals because it will help them and they will learn and they will grow and they'll grow their wealth, but it will really help them. So anyway, people know when it's genuine and they know when it's not. So I think that's, you know, one thing that we think of sales, we think it's this sleazy thing that you, oh, you got it, you know, this used car kind of thing. And it's, it's not like that at all. It's more of a high trust. How can I just help you kind of thing? Yeah, no, and that's a great point. I mean, I've, I've said that to people too. I've said, look, you need to do this. <laughs> if you don't do it with me, okay, that's fine. 
let me help you find someone else then to do it with because i think that it's it's a very it's just such a good strategy for so many things whether that's you know debt relief or retirement or just you know sort of building wealth right now you know kind of getting getting out of the rat race there's just so much so many benefits to it you touched on the tax benefits i mean there's there's so much there that that yeah we don't know it's it's not taught to us in school and so yeah, just kind of kind of getting it out there. And so I, I'd imagine, you know, it, it grows organically, right? So you you met these guys at, at the meetup and they liked you and were willing to invest. And so maybe they tell their friends, you know, and, and so you kind of just keep, it's like, a, I imagine it gets easier, like the farther you, you know, the more, the more capital raising you've done, it's easier to have those conversations. Yeah, yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's a little, it's a little, it's kind of an artistic process. And my, my background is sales. So I understand some of that. But when it comes to like money, and it's, you know, it's, competitive, it's just, it's hard to like, explain, you know, exactly how it works, or what makes you or I or any listener say, Oh, I'm going to choose that person to invest. There's something I like about Jason. I like the way he, you know, he's trustworthy. He's a, also a vet, or he's in this background, or the way he says this, I just trust him. And I think he knows what he's talking about. So then people will invest with you or they'll invest with me. And it's, um, but I, I don't fully understand. I do know though, too, the more you can try to understand people's problems and you can find out the, you know, the almost the exact type of person that you can help. So I can tell you for me, my guy, like his name is Bart and he's 58 years old. He lives in Southern California. He's got two daughters that are getting ready to go to away, go away to college. He likes his job. He's, I mean, this is, this is a real person that I know, but I put a name to him. I put thing. I, I kind of feel like I understand his problem. So I know in general, you know, the person that I'm reaching is usually, uh, it, sometimes it's women, but usually it's guys kind of age forties, you know, early mid forties up to 70. And they have certain, you know, they're either a business owner or they're a high paid professional and I'm trying to solve certain problems. And so I'm trying to help them to understand maybe even a problem that they don't know that they already have. So I, the ways I do that, I do that through these monthly webinar events where I gather three speakers and we talk, we have one on multifamily coming up. We do them on inflation. And then I do these YouTube videos where I just try to educate people with a whiteboard. Here's how this, here's how inflation really works, or here's how passive investing really works. And when you do that kind of stuff and people get value out of it, they sort of say, Oh, wow, this person, like I'm really getting something from this. So again, it's, it's, you almost have to give, you have to give more and you have to do it for the reason you really want to help them. And then people are just drawn to it. It's kind of a, it's, it's kind of a weird thing. You're never really asking for money. You're just simply saying, there's a problem here. And this is a passion of mine. I can help you. And then the process of that, people are drawn to you. And it's, it's, it's kind of a magical thing, but it's, it's very understandable. If somebody's trustworthy and they're also providing value, it's, it's not going to be difficult for them to raise money over yeah. time. I mean, it's going to take a lot of, a lot of work, especially on the front end. It's going to take a ton of work, but eventually it'll be like, oh, okay. Yeah. This person, they're just going to be able to raise the money. <laughs> More than 63 conversations. It's a, <laughs> yeah. And that was a start with zero, with zero conversions. You know, <laughs> it's a big, it's a big, uh, a big commitment to, to just, you know, and being okay with people saying no, right. Just yeah. the, the fact that most of the people you talk to probably aren't going to invest, at least not initially, they might eventually come around, but yeah, most of the people you talk to are probably going to be, you know, mm, going to wait on the sidelines for this one. And, and then uh, hopefully with time, they can see the benefits. But yeah, it's, it's just a matter of keep, put, keep putting it out there. Yeah. Yeah. And I think too, everybody has different goals and different timing. And so again, it's, it's challenging when you have a, a live deal because you're like, I got to fill this deal. I told them I'd raise, you know, half a million or, you know, like it's kind of like a little bit of pressure, but you have to just in your own, just be like, you know what, like I'll raise the money or I won't, or you have to kind of release that a little bit to be like, okay, whatever it is, I just need to help people. And sometimes the way you build trust is you say, you know what, this really isn't the right time for you, but maybe in the future or, you know, maybe this other deal or something. And it's just amazing. Those are high, like big time trust building things when you can be like, I know you want to invest, but maybe this just isn't the right deal for you. Or uh, in the future, you know, this is the type of investment, you know, structure that you might really enjoy. And just by explaining that to somebody, it can really help them to be like, oh, I, I, yeah, I feel like I understand it. And so this is a common conversation. I should say common, but you know, I've had so many calls now that, you know, I imagine, you know, there's one call comes to mind where the guy, doctor is worth 5 million. We asked what the net worth is. He's worth 5 million and he's never invested in real estate. And so for him, I would say, you know, putting a minimum, you know, some minimums are typically 50 to a hundred thousand dollars into a deal. 
and getting some confidence in passive investing and multifamily would be huge for him because all he's doing is stocks. And, and I just, I get so concerned when, you know, somebody's all in stocks and, you know, they've, they've gone up, you know, five, six fold in the last 12 years. And I'm like, I don't know. I just think there's a much better way to do it. But again, I have my own biases as well. So. <laughs> yeah, sure. And I don't, I mean, stocks are fine. Like I don't, I don't have a, a problem with people investing in stocks and, and I invest in stocks, but I do think that you're definitely missing some of those really substantial benefits if you're not also investing in real estate, right? There's, uh, it's, it doesn't have to be either or. Um, yes, I am also now biased towards real estate. <laughs> the more I learn about it, the more I, I feel that it's, it's a, a much more predictable, safe and, and scalable type of investment vehicle than stocks where you're completely reliant on the whim of the market, basically. Um, you know, here, here with, with actual physical assets we have <laughs> that we can go in and improve and, uh, you know, force appreciation. It, it's a, it's a, that's a big win, a big, uh, a big control point, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. I, I used to be an investment advisor and so I'd advise people on stocks and bonds and we had some alternative assets we did as well. And I just, the more I learn about wall street, it's just, uh, you know, the fees, I mean, the fees of an average mutual fund is around 3.2%, even though they say it's about 1.2%, there's all these hidden fees. And then the advisor additionally takes usually one and a half to 2%. So that's like, you know, five, five and a half percent, which is, you know, the stock where you usually have returns about six or 8% per year. So it's most of your money. So to me, it, it really, I've kind of gotten a place where um, I, it's not that I don't invest in stocks. It's just that there's some real ethical dilemmas there that I find it really hard. And especially when there's, you know, this traditional, we call it traditional, right? This traditional investment can, can crash by 50% and it's happened multiple, multiple times over the years. So I just, uh, I get concerned for people, you know, that, that there are, you know, real assets that I think are, are actually more traditional, but they don't call them traditional. But uh, I, that's why I think what, we, what we're doing is so powerful, Jason. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's weird to me that they call real estate an alternative, alternative investment. I'm yeah. Like, I think that real estate's the thing that everybody's been investing for forever. Like that, the alternative should be the other stuff. Yeah, exactly. It's a weird, uh, it's a weird name for it, I guess. Um, Bronson, with, with your company, are you, you know, you mentioned before it's a team sport, which it very much is. Are you focused kind of exclusively on capital raising or are you um, doing any of the uh, acquisitions or asset management or you, you sort of set, set yeah. in your role that, that you're obviously very good at? Yeah. So I, for a couple of years, I was, uh, you know, part of, of one team. And so I basically partnered on each deal and did, you know, a lot of conversations around, you know, the, the capital and putting investors into deals. Uh, I found if I work with different partners, so again, typically we'll have capital partners and operating partners, um, it, ju it just has really dramatically increased my deal flow. Previously, there'd be a time where six or eight months would go by, we wouldn't have a single deal to offer investors. And now, I mean, I'm, we've done three deals in the last four months. And so just being able to open up new uh, deal flow. Um, so, you know, for me, I, I look at it this way. I mean, I uh, my focus is, you know, I'm a passive investor as well. So I invest significantly in each deal. I do my own underwriting, which means I look at kind of the, the, the numbers and how the deal actually looks it just quite in detail. And I, and, and I get a lot of offers to partner with different, uh, different people, but I try to find one that ones that really make sense to me. And then I go visit each property. I'll go walk units. I'll walk competing units. I'll be a part of the asset management. I'm not the primary asset manager. And then I do raise money. And then I also do something called uh, investor relations, which is after a deal closes, communicating with investors. So I'm involved in every level. I'm not the one that finds the deal. I'm not the primary asset manager, but I am definitely a general partner on every deal. And I give input in, into it in a way. But uh, but yeah, we've kind of segmented it too. You know, are you, a, are you an operator? Are you a capital person? But uh, but yeah, so so to me, it really allows me to kind of have the best of both worlds where I can invest. I can really bring my skills. I can look and say, hey, what do I really like about this market, this deal, this team? But I'm not necessarily the one who's got, you know, 20 years of experience managing a multifamily asset, but I partner with people that, that are very experienced. And so, um, so, you know, it, it, I like that because it allows me some flexibility, allows my investors some flexibility. Yeah, no, that I mean, that's a great strategy. And I think the fact that you are, you know, being a part of due diligence and the walkthroughs and, and, and even on the asset management side, just at least being cognizant of everything that's going on from an operational standpoint, 
it really allows you to bring more value to your investors, right? Because you're not just like, hey, I, here's this deal. We got to put some, <laughs> let's put some money in there. You can really talk to them about, and, and some investors will, are just going to trust you and they're going to, you know, going to go in with the deals that you, that you like. Uh, but at the same time, you're, some of them are going to want more deep, more detail and you'll be able to provide that as, as the investor relations person. So I think that's, that's a great way to sort of approach it. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah, like just what you said, it helps build trust with people. And then it just gives me the flexibility to you know, work with the people I want to work with. And, um, and then, and then, yeah, like my, my strengths though, I think really are in both education, helping people to understand how all this stuff works. And then also just relationally, like I love, you know, meeting new people and connecting with them and helping them to understand, like, it really is very meaningful for me personally. And then I, so again, I think it's, a lot of people, you know, some people listening, like, well, what do I do? How do I get started? And usually it's one of two ways. Like either you start kind of doing what I did where you start raising money, or if you're more of an analytical person and you like spreadsheets and you, you, you know, the, the way that route is really finding a deal. And these days, if you can find a deal, um, it's, it's actually easier to raise money these days than it is to find a really great deal. So you can find a deal, you can find partners, or you can bring it to somebody who's more experienced, and then you get the operations experience as well. So there's kind of a couple different roads to get started in multifamily, but those are two common ways. Yeah. Yeah. It does. It does seem that that's kind of, those are the ins, right? Like in the, in the beginning, you're either raising capital for other people or you're, you're kind of bringing someone more experienced that deal and to, to be a part of. So it, it does, it does make, uh, make a bit of a, an inroad there to be able to get started. So yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Um, Bronson, let me, let me shift gears a little bit and we'll go to, you know, sort of the, the questions that I like to ask every guest. I'm excited to hear your answers about these. Um, so I think the, the first one is, is very, you know, sort of related to the, to the title of the podcast, know your why. And so I ask, ask everyone, what is your why? And, and usually we've talked a little bit about it up to that point, but I do like to kind of get a feel for what really, you know, what really drives you, what, what's really, you know, kind of your, your focus goals and, and sort of achieve, you know, what to achieve that next level, what, what pushes you? Yeah. So I, uh, through a series of experiences and just, um, I have, uh, my sister actually has this organization that raises money for human trafficking called Dressember. And they've raised, I think, 25 or $30 million over the last seven years. So she's raised more money for this than I've raised for multifamily deals. But it basically is to fight human trafficking. So today, in 2021, there are 20 to 40 million human slaves in the world. And that number will continue to rise uh, unless we do something about it. And there's things from just different, you know, labor or sexual human slavery or other things. But to me, there was a moment that happened a couple of years ago where I said, you know, this is a cause that I feel is really worth living and dying for. So my goal is to create, you know, resources, uh, you know, to, or to generate resources that can really help in this cause to give, to support, to create awareness, to do anything I possibly can to stop it because it's, it's such a huge, huge, huge problem. And we just, most people go about our days. We have no idea that this is going on. And so that's my big why. Yeah. I, you said 20 to 40 million. Uh -huh. Yeah. I, it's yeah, I didn't, I mean, I've staggering. Yeah. He, hearing you hear about human trafficking and things like that, but you're right. It's kind of one of those things that it's like, I mean, I don't know if it's around me, right. It's kind of one of the, you're just not as aware of it. Um, do you want to, do you want to talk a little bit about the the charity and, and so people. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I'll, I'll just, uh, yeah. So basically in the month of December, um, you know, women wear dresses or guys wear ties and they just basically post on social media that they're creating this awareness for, and they'll basically do a campaign to raise money for human trafficking, to fight human trafficking. And so, uh, that's just, I think it's dressember.org. You can go on and check it out. But, uh, to me, yeah, it's just, it's, it's just something that there's so many facets to it. And yet I also feel like it's a very solvable problem. It's just something that if we, if we focus on it then it actually can change. There's this idea, if you see something, you know, or excuse me, if, if you look, if you look at something and you, you know, you, you can look away, but if you really see something, it's hard to unsee it. And there's been some things that like just through stories and through some of the stories of these women that have been rescued and you know, I guess less than 1% are ever rescued. And so there's, it's just, it's very tragic. But once you actually really see what's happening, 
um, to me, it just, it just made me say, you know what, that's, that's my why. Like that's, that's why I'm here is to really, and I have other whys. I want to be a great dad and I want to, you know, do other, there's other goals that I have, but to me, like, that's the big one. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. Uh, that's, that's an amazing cause. So dress December, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll get that in the show notes too, but I think that'll be, um, maybe we can create some sort of movement for all the listeners to participate in dress December. That would be pretty cool. Yeah. Um, uh, I love that. Well, I guess on a lighter note, tell us something uh, that people don't know about you. Maybe um, you know a secret skill or a hobby or something that you're you're trying to get uh, trying to get into any any particular interest. Anything you, you're comfortable sharing? Yeah. Well, what came to mind? Uh, most people don't know. I'm actually I, I'm really good at dad jokes, and my superpower as a kid has been quoting ran, random movie lines. And so my favorite movie of all time is actually Nacho Libre. So if nobody has not seen Nacho Libre, it's wonderful. So I just love yeah. being goofy and silly. So <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, I, I, uh, it's weird, but once I became a dad, dad jokes were like an automatic thing. It's like <laughs> my son says has his jokes, and it's like jokes from a two year old. They they don't make any sense, but he gets a kick out of them, and so it makes me laugh. So. Yeah, you can, you can really get a lot of joy from dad jokes. Oh yeah, oh yeah, all day long. <laughs> yeah, um, how can people reach you? We'll, we'll, like I said, we'll get the dress, dress Ember thing in the show notes, but um, any any other particular way you, you like people? Yeah, yeah. yeah, so I have I have a uh, report, uh, like a, it's, it's a special report. It's called the Single Best Investing Strategy During and After a Pandemic. It's all about, the, excuse me, the benefits of investing in multifamily investing. And it's 24 color pages. You can uh, go to my website, bronsonequity.com and you can download it there. And there's more information there as well. You learn about our investor club or different things like that. But uh, yeah, people can feel free to reach out through that. So Okay, awesome. Yeah, so check, check that out in, on the website. Final question, Bronson, what piece of advice would you give to people that are maybe, uh, you know, a, a few years behind you in terms of, um, trying to maybe have similar goals. They want to get to where you're at. What, what, what would you tell them? What would you give as, as motivation? Um, I would say really visualize where you want to be. If you want to leave your job with passive income, if you want to leave it to do other things that are important to you, which was the case for me, it's just, it, it really doesn't have to take that long. To me, it just took a direct focus and work and effort going to meet us. I mean, I was basically for a little, for a while doing, you know, 30 hours or more at my job. And then I was doing 30, 40 hours in real estate, but just, you know, recently the last couple of months, I was able to leave my great corporate job. And so now I'm full-time real estate, which is, which is amazing. So I think it's That's really the power of setting goals and just really, uh, you know, also too, that, you know, real estate income is much more preferable to regular income because it's taxed so much lower. I mean, I literally end up paying almost no like income tax because just the way real estate works. And yeah. so you can actually make less money with real estate and still actually bring home more, uh, which is kind of amazing. So I would say the biggest thing is just, you know, Tony Robbins has this quote and he says, it's in your moments of decision that your destiny is shaped. And it's just really that you're making the decision that I'm going to do whatever it takes to grow. I'm going to invest. I'm going to network. I'm going to raise money. I'm going to look at deals, whatever those small or large things are and just work toward them. And if you do, you'll get where you want to go. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. I mean, and it's, you know, it's really a great point. You said it, it doesn't, it doesn't really take that long. Now it's not, it's not get rich overnight. Right. But it's, right. it's get rich fairly soon if you work at it and like get rich definitively right it's not just like you're not you're not scratching a lottery ticket like if you just do this stuff and work at it it's it's really gonna work like whether yeah. and that's whether you're doing it actively or passively either way you can you can very very quickly you know kind of build up uh that that passive income well, also the skill, just the skill of being learning how to invest, you know, yourself is so, so valuable. And so then when you have resources, you generate for other people, you generate for yourself. Um, it's amazing. If you know, you can get about 15% return per year, which we're seeing that in a lot of investments that we do and, and a lot of multifamily stuff that's out there. Um, you know, that's your, your money doubles every five to seven years, which is incredible. It's just compound interest, which, you know, it, it becomes a snowball, like you said. So learning that skill even beyond you raising money or you doing deals is just so, so valuable. Yeah. Yeah. And, and doubling every five to seven years with virtually no taxes. 
So yeah. it's, like you said, it's, it's, you can, the amount of money you have there or you need there can be less than what you might think you need at a, at a W-2 job where you're having a sort of normal, uh, normal wage tax rate, tax rates. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Awesome. Well, this was great. Uh, thank you so much, Bronson, for coming on. I, I really enjoyed it. I uh, appreciate your time. And I think, um, I'm, I'm, uh, I feel like I need to do some research on human trafficking and, and definitely get, get involved with Dressember. Um, sounds like a fantastic cause. So, so thank you for sharing that too. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for having me. This has been awesome. And again, I think the why, knowing your why is much more important than the what or how much money or any of that stuff is you have to start with why, just as yeah. Simon Sinek says, right? <laughs> I, have, I have yet to talk to someone who said that their why was because I want to you know, sleep on bags of money. That's it's just not not motivating enough. It's really not it's not what it's all about. There's there's much bigger things in life. So thank you so much. I, I do appreciate it. Bob, thanks, Jason. All right. Every day, everybody have a good day.